Okay, so good evening, everyone. We're going to conclude class number six. Every, every week we uh, pick a different story of the Torah, secrets of the Bible. Tonight we're going to discuss also one of the most famous stories of the Torah. It is the story in the book of Numbers, in the portion of Korach, of Bamidbar, the story of the rebellion of Korach against Moses, also one of the most famous stories of the Torah. And so we're going to discuss what is it about this story that's relevant. Was Korach just a bad person looking for power? Was he a villain, like in a uh, like in a movie or a book, that just wanted power for himself, and was very charismatic and decided that he was going to try to challenge Moshe? Did he have any valid points? And why does the Torah tell us the story about Korach and his downfall? Does the Torah just want to tell us another story about a challenge to Moses and how Moses emerged victorious? Or is this story an important lesson for us today? Of course, we know by now that every story in the Torah has an important lesson. So we have to ask ourselves, why does the Torah tell us the story and what are we learning from this? There are a number of key things that we're going to discuss, a number of key questions, but as always, um, as we found out in all of these classes, there's always one idea that when we fully understand it, a different type of story than we imagined, than we, are, than we had previously considered emerges, and this, we look at the story in an altogether different kind of way. And so, <clears throat> The basics of the story is that Korach was Moshe's cousin and he was a Levite. As you know that the Jewish people were divided into three groups, the Kohanim, the Leviim, and the Yisraelim. Originally, the 12 tribes were not divided originally that way. The, the priests, the Kohanim, were going to be the firstborn of every family. Subsequent to the story of the golden calf, God took away the privilege of the kahuna from the other tribes who had participated. The only shevet, the only tribe that did not interact and was uninvolved in the creation and the worshiping of the golden calf was Moshe's tribe, the tribe of Levi. As it says in the portion of Kitisa, that Moshe calls out when he comes down from the mountain and he sees what happened. He, see, he said, Mi la Hashem Eli, who is still faithful to Hashem? Who is still believes in one God? Come to me. And it says, Vayes for love, Kobane Levi, and only the children of Levi came to him, which means they were the only untarnished tribe of all the Shabbatim. After that, Hashem, so to speak, demoted and took away the privilege from the other tribes of having a representative of, in the temple and gave it to the tribe of Levi. The idea, the idea behind it is that to be a Kohen, to be a faithful servant to Hashem, one cannot be someone who denies the very validity of who Hashem and, and denies the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments of idolatry, which is what the golden calf was. And so therefore, the only people who were able to remain pure in that mission was the tribe of Levi. Um, similarly, I think I remember we once discussed not to go off on a different topic. We once discussed why is it that the, the Bet Hamikdash, the temple in Jerusalem, was put in this portion of Benjamin in in Benjamin and not in any other tribe. And one of the reasons that's given is because all of the brothers, all of the tribes, at one point bow down to Esav when Yaakov in, in the portion last week of Ayishlach meets his brother after 34 years. It says that Yaakov and all of his children bow down to Esav in order to show him honor and respect. The only person who did it was who didn't do it was Benjamin, and that was uh, because he wasn't born yet. He because he wasn't born, he was the one he was the one left that never bowed his head down to Esav. And so the lesson from it was that the only place, the holiest place in the world, where a Jew goes to bow down to Hashem should be in the portion of someone who never bowed down to any other human being, to any other power in the world. 
And that's why it was given to Binyamin. As you know, that Jewish people were not allowed to bow down. That's the, the, the famous story we're coming up now. Hanukkah starts tomorrow night. One of the most famous stories of Hanukkah is the story, the tragic story of Hana and her seven sons who wouldn't bow down to the ring of the king. And the story of Purim in the Megillah, what's the central story that creates the animosity of Haman to Mordechai? Everybody is bowing down to Haman and Mordechai won't bow down. So this, is, this has been the Jewish red line from the beginning of time that a Jew does not bow down to nobody. The only place where we bow down is to Hashem. And the only place where a Jew was allowed to bow down properly was in the Beit HaMikdash in the temple. And that's why Binyamin, who was the only person who never bowed down to Esav, never bowed down to anyone else, he had the privilege of having the Beit HaMikdash built in his territory. From this we see that Hashem is very careful how he rewards people measure for measure. And since the Kohanim and the Levim, who were all from Trevet Levi, were the ones who were the only ones not involved in bowing down and worshiping a golden calf, they were then the ones who Hashem says, you the one, you can be the ones to bow down in the temple and to serve Hashem in the Beit HaMikdash. In any event, the, the Jewish people then were divided into three groups, Kohanim, who were descendants of Aaron, Levim, who were Moshe and his descendants, and the Israelim, all the other tribes of the Jewish people. And so the story comes along that Korach gathers several hundred people from the tribe of Ruvain, primarily the Torah says, and he creates a mutiny, he creates a challenge, a rebellion, an open rebellion to Moshe, and his claim to Moshe is, what are you doing? Everybody is holy, we were all on Mount Sinai, who are you to become a ruler? And you uh, play nepotism, you make Aaron, your brother, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Really, Moshe himself wanted to be the high priest. Hashem took it away from him. It's another long story in the portion of Shemot. But they, ch but Korach is challenging Moshe. Who are you to become the head? You, you made yourself the leader of the Jewish people. You took power for yourself. And you gave your older brother to be the high priest, the holiest position. Everybody is holy. Why do we need a hierarchy of leadership in the Jewish people. Why do we need rabbis, kohanim, levis? Everybody is the same. Hashem created all of us. Uh, he was the first uh, full-blown socialist, so to speak, that this is what he wanted, that everybody should be the same and there shouldn't be divisions amongst the Jewish people. And the... The paradox of this story is that on the one hand, Korach seemingly had a good idea. Korach, Korach's intention in one level is noble because it's true. Every Jew is a creation of Hashem. Every Jew has an Hashemah that's part of Hashem. And every Jew is holy. And if that's the case, why does Moshe insist upon making all these divisions amongst the Jewish people, wouldn't we be better off that if everybody was the same and not have leaders and different status of judges and uh, Sanhedrin, et cetera, et cetera. But the flip side that we're going to find out from the story is, is that such an argument generally is deceitful and not intellectually honest because Korach himself was not a regular from, from the rank and file. He himself was a levy. He himself was an elitist. And as a matter of fact, we, we see from Korach's argument that he wanted to have greater power himself. Korach, the Talmud tells us, was one of the wealthiest Jews. He was very wealthy. Um, there's a Yiddish expression, when you want to say that someone's super, uber wealthy, you say, he's rich like Karach. Karach was super wealthy. And as we all know, living in 2020, it took, I don't, it took many, many thousands of years for us to figure this, that wealth and power are two people that hold hands. They're two corruptible powers that hold hands 
time and time again, because wealth begets power, power begets more wealth, and they both corrupt. And absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And therefore, when you have the wealthiest people, the wealthiest person, Korach, challenging Moshe and saying, hey, we should all be the same. Who are you? Why are you making yourself a leader? Why are you taking power for yourself? It, um, it, it raises more questions than it answers. That why is it Korach? Why is it, why is it always the one who has power who's fighting for more power? The, 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 the basis of understanding this class, really, and the, the story behind it is to understand the difference between what Korach was wanted and was challenging and what Moshe's answer to Korach was in the name of Hashem. Korach was challenging Moshe that there should be absolute equality. And Moshe was saying that, no, that this system was put in place by Hashem and harmony and unity amongst the Jewish people can only come through this way, not through the pseudo pluralism that Korach was advocating for. So let's go into some of the text and we'll talk about how, what are some of the key questions and why the story requires a deeper understanding than what we read as straightforward. So technically, as you can see on your screen, essentially what, what Moshe was establishing was a system, a system of a high priest under the high priest are Kohanim, under the Kohanim are Levim, and it's so on and so forth. Whereas Korach maintains that there shouldn't be a pyramid system. There should be a mishmash where everybody is the same. As he, as I mentioned before, the, the language he uses is, why are you elevating yourself? Everybody is holy. We all heard the same Torah from the same God at the same time. Now, obviously, um, as I said, mentioned before, the argument is a little bit disingenuous because the truth is, that nobody thought that everybody was equal because no, everybody saw that Hashem told Moshe to go up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and the, and the tablets. God didn't tell Korach. God didn't tell everybody else. He, God chose Moshe. So obviously, everybody understood that Moshe was different than everybody and Moshe was chosen by Hashem for this task. Nevertheless, what Korach seems to be suggesting, not that we shouldn't have any leaders whatsoever, not that there should be, you know, just plain old anarchy, everybody does whatever they want, but the type of leader that Moshe was, and leadership that Moshe was trying to put in place, Korach thought was harmful and detrimental to the Jewish people. In an era where you had absolute power, where you had pharaohs and kings who were ultimate, who were what we would call demigods, and had absolute power and authority over everybody's life, Korach wanted to, to establish that all, hum, all of humanity should have the same basic privileges. And so we, many of you are familiar with the famous Medrash that Korach gathers 250 great people and he puts on them a talit that's all made of tchelet out of blue wool, as you know. And the, the Torah says that when, when you wear a garment of, of, of wool, that uh, you should have on the fringes, one of the fringes should be made of tchelet, which is a dyed blue or purple wool. And so he was trying to mock motion. He puts on a garment that's full of tchelet. The whole garment is made of tchelet. And he says, Moshe, does it need tchelet or not on one of the strings? And Moshe says, yes. And he would laugh at him and say, but if you have a complete garment where one string of tchelet takes care of that entire garment. If you have the whole garment made of tchelet, how much more so shouldn't you need that one string? And he did the same thing. He, he filled up a room, a home full of holy books. And he, he asked Moshe, what should be the ruling of a house that's full of books, of, of holy books? Does he need a mezuzah on the door? 
And Moshe said, of course. And he said, that's so silly. The whole Torah that has 275 parshas does not make a home does not make a home um, free from the obligation of mezuzah, but a mezuzah that has only one portion of the Torah. Remember, what's in a mezuzah? A mezuzah has the, has the portion of the Shema. The Shema is just one portion out of many, many, many in the Torah. And yet we say that this one portion in a mezuzah takes care of the obligation for the whole home. Why shouldn't, if you have a Sefer Torah inside your house that has the Shema, imagine if you had 10 Torahs in your house, 15 Chumashes in your house, that has the Shema many times over, Korach was trying to say that it's silly to say that you should need a mezuzah on top of that as well, when you have much more than that in your home. And he, what he was trying to establish that Moshe was making up these commandments, they didn't come from Hashem. Um, what is the essence of Korach's argument that he's trying to do with all these different arguments? He, basically, he's saying here is, is that a home full of holy books is similar to look, like the Jewish people. Everybody is holy or a garment made completely of techelet, of the special wool, dyed wool, is similar to the Jewish people. We are all have the same holiness. Why do we need one more mezuzah on the door? Why do we need one more string? In addition to that, the, the, seemingly, the seeming argument is, if the whole Jewish people are holy, like a, like a house full of books or like a talit, why do we need one more person like Moshe to be separate, uh, like a mezuzah or like a string of techelet, and to create another leader on top of all of them, when all of the Jewish people are leaders. As a matter of fact, in the portion of Yitro before Hashem gives the Torah, Hashem suggests that that's what he wanted for the Jewish people themselves. He says, Ve'atem tiyuli, mamlechet kohanim v'go kadosh. Hashem says that before, when I give you the Torah, I'm going to make you for me, a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Hashem wanted all, every single Jew to be a priest and a king. The idea was that every Jew was going to have that kind of elevated status. Yes, things happen later on, but we see that Hashem wanted, the, int the intention was that every single Jew should be on a very, very high pedestal. That being the case, Korach's argument is not out of, totally out of line. There is some logic to it. Why the Jewish people who are trying to run away from authoritarian powers, from slavery, from Egypt, should create a new society of different levels of power, why not have a totally free democracy where everybody has equal access? Korach wants to know why does Moshe and Aaron have to wield the kind of power that they do? So Moshe's, Moshe's pattern that he's establishing is that the Jewish people have different categories and different groupings. And Karach says, we all had the same revelation. We're all the same. We're not, we're not another level underneath you on the pyramid. But as I said before, there's an, there is an inherent contradiction in Karach's argument because I told you Karach was a levy, which means he himself had special status. And it's usually, as we see, the people who have special status that are the ones that are fighting because they want more. As the expression goes, that power begets power. Someone who, who has a little bit wants more and more and more. It's insatiable. And when Korach challenges Moshe, we see from Moshe's answer, we see what Moshe understood that what Korach wanted. You see what Korach writes on one side of your screen. Korach challenges Moshe. The entire community is holy. Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim. They are all holy. But in Moshe's response to Korach, Moshe tells Korach, and he turns to the people, and he says, why are you challenging what Hashem? Is it not enough? Hashem, Moshe tells Korach, is it not, not enough for you that Hashem put you in the tribe of Levi and he separated you and he gave you this great status to be a levy and to serve in the temple. Uvi kashtim gam kahuna. Moshe says, and now you are requesting also to be a priest. 
Rashi and the Talmud co comment on it that Moshe was telling them, I also want it. Moshe, I told you, was the was a levy. Moshe is the father of all the levies. And Moshe tells Korach, you know, I also want it, but it's not my choice. It's not my choice. You think I, cho I chose this power by myself? Hashem is dictating it. Hashem is deciding it. So if I had the choice to who to make a coin gadol, don't you think I would have appointed myself instead of giving it to my brother? I would have my made myself coin gadol. So Moshe says, I also want to be a coin. Hashem said, Moshe, you're going to be a levi. Okay. To, to be a great, to be a spiritual servant of Hashem, to be a coin or a levi is not an issue of power. It's an issue of humility and of subservience. To, yet you were serving Hashem. It requires acceptance. Moshe is telling Korach that now you also seek the priesthood, which means that Korach was talking from two sides of his mouth. On the one hand, he's challenging Moshe, the entire community is holy, and who are you to become a leader? And on the other hand, that we see from Moshe's response to Korach, that Korach himself wanted to climb the rung higher for himself, and that he was seeking to, to move up, to graduate from the Levi to a Kohen, which is why Moshe challenges him that you also seek the priesthood? Isn't the, isn't the, the privilege of being a Levi enough for you? Why do you have to be a Kohen too? And Moshe says, I identify with you, Korach. I also want it, but I accept that this is the division. This is the role that God wants me to play. If I accept it, you should as well. Korach, at least on one side, is demanding equality. But from Moshe's position, response to Korach, we see that what Korach really wanted was a higher position for himself. Throughout history, uh, some of you who are with us tonight probably have can, can relate to it even be much better than I can. People who came from societies that were very tumultuous and went through revolutions from one type of authoritarianism to a different type where, where um, absolute royal bloodline of power was, was rebelled against with this idea that all people should be equal, whether it's you know, pure socialism or communism or other forms of isms, we find that the very people who sought to create equality became even greater corruptors of power and became mm -hmm. bigger monsters. And so you, what happens with people is, strangely enough, when someone yells, 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 I want to, we want equality for everybody, but I'm going to decide, I'm going to create the rules of equality. You're just trading in one form of authoritarianism for an, for an even worse despot. Um, and so we, we know that, that on some level we yearn, there's a, there's a Zen to have this idea of equality where everybody's the same, but history has shown that the people who are who advocate and the people who want to create and control that system are some of the most ruthless and um, ambitious people of power. And it's it, the, the, the way they do it is to create a system where they control every aspect of your life under the guise and under the idea that it's 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 that we are freeing ourselves from power of humans over humans but it ends up being the subjugation of all humans rather than just some. And the question is, how do we find, how do we strike a balance? Is it possible for humanity to live with equality without having hierarchies of positions of leadership of power in a society? Or does, does, is Korach's request a dream, a utopian dream that cannot exist? Or does Korach's dream have some validity? Even if it was coming from a very flawed and blemished um, person and, and spokesperson because we see from himself that what he's advocating is not what he wants for himself. He's on one side, he's demanding equality, but he wants equality on his terms that he wants to go higher and then he's going to set up that system himself. Okay. So, is everybody with me so far? Any questions on what we, where, where we are so far? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So right. let's, go, let's go question number one. Question number one is, Korach argued that everyone is equally holy. Sounds like a great argument. Why was he wrong? Was he wrong? 
Well, we know he was wrong because, <laughs> because the end of the story is not a mystery. We all know the end. Of, we all know the, We all read the book. And we know how the story ends. And God chooses Moshe's way, not Korach's way. And Korach went tumbling, tumbling down deep beneath the earth. So we know that Korach's uh, plan did not survive. N neither did he. The question is, why was he wrong? It seems like that Korach has a very, very valid point. When you go through the, the, later on in, in the, the Talmud, the Talmud tells us, it's, it's mentioned in Pirkei Avos, it's mentioned in the Talmud, that when we talk about divisiveness and arguments, Korach is always held up as the embodiment, it was the epitome of divisiveness and arguments. The, in, in Pirkei Avos it says, what's a machloket l'shem shemayim, and what's a machloket not l'shem shemayim, which means what is considered a holy argument and what is considered a rebellious non-holy argument. And, it, and the Pirkei Avos says that a holy argument is Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai, arguing over Torah law. A argument that's not for the sake of heaven is Korach against Moshe. As a matter of fact, it says that whoever argues it says whoever argues against the leaders of the Jewish people violates a commandment in the Torah that says in, in the um, sorry it says whoever anyone who engages the Talmud says anyone who engages in divisiveness in any kind of machloket whatsoever Someone who likes to get into arguments and engages in machloket transgresses a biblical prohibition because at the end of the story of Korach, it says, and it never again shall it be like Korach and his company and his cohorts, which means that Hashem says that the Jewish people should not have anything to do with this kind of arguments and rebelliousness. Jews should not fight like this. And someone who likes to fight like Korach violates a commandment. But why is Korach seen as the model for all kinds of arguments and anything that's divisive? Why is Korach the model for that? Korach was trying to do just the opposite. He was trying to create uniformity. He was trying to create equality. And so it seems like it backfired. It seems like it's not fear. Korach was challenging Moshe that everybody should be equal. And instead we hold them up as the model of the opposite of divisiveness, disunity, and rebelliousness. Question number three, why did Korach aspire to a higher position for himself? Why is he contradicting himself? Why is Korach asking Moshe to, to put him up? Why is, it, why is it coming from jealousy that he wants to be a Kohen himself if what he's advocating for is the opposite of that there should be no Kohens and, or everybody's a Kohen? So here you see in this chart, how you have the Israelites, the 12, 13, it's, it's divided, you see where it says 12. Originally, the, the Shvatim were divided into, into 12 tribes. When they came into the land of Israel, they were really, the Jews were really divided into 13 tribes because Joseph was divided into two tribes. That was the blessing that Jacob gave Yosef, that Yosef would be divided into Menashe and Ephraim, into two separate tribes. And so the tribe of Levi did not get land and it was divided still into 12 tribes, but it was divided That's... amongst two tribes of Menashe and Ephraim, and Levi did not get it, their own section of Israel. But you see, as the Israelites, they were the working class, they were the farmers, the agrarians, the merchants, the business people, and they were the ones who got territory. The Levi, they were given a spiritual task, and they were given cities, 48 cities spread out, throughout the land of Israel. There are cities where they were there so they can be guides and spiritual leaders, the rabbis of the Jewish people. They trace their lineage all the way back. Moshe was the first Levi. Then you have priests, the Kohanim. They were Aaron's descendants. All descendants of Aaron became Kohanim, starting from Aaron and his children, Nadav Aviyu, Elazar and Itamar. Then Elazar became the high priest after Aaron. And then after Elazar became Pinchas and so on and so forth. 
And then you have the high, the holiest of the holy, the holiest priest, the the Kohen, the Kohen Gadol. And he had the privilege of doing the holiest service in the in, in the holy temple on the Kodesh Kadashim on Yom Kippur to, to pray for forgiveness of the Jewish people. So, what, what, so we see from here that God created different roles for the Jewish people. He wanted some of them to be involved in material occupation. He gave them land. The land needed to be planted. It needed to be harvested. It needed to be cultivated. The cities needed to be cultivated. He made some Jews businessmen, some Jews merchants, some Jews farmers, and some Jews priests and Levites. Interestingly enough, by the way, the way the land of Israel was divided amongst the different tribes tells us also what their vocations were supposed to be. For example, in the blessings of Yaakov to, the, to, his, to his sons before he passed away, for example, he blesses Usher. He says, may Usher shmein alachma. Usher was blessed like, the, like, like um, precious olives, olive oil. Um, the tr so what's fascinating is that every tribe was given an, a territory, an area of land that was most conducive to fulfill the, the blessing and the type of personality and characteristic of that tribe. Usher was given area in the north of Israel that produces the best olive groves. The best olives in Israel were produced in Usher's territory. Why? Usher was blessed hundreds and hundreds of years before the Jewish people came into Israel Usher was already blessed to be a successful olive producing tribe. Um, most of the oil, most of the olive oil came from there. All, all the olive oil that was used for the temple and for the menorah came from the tribe of Usher's territory. Um, Zevulun, for example, was blessed to be a ship, uh, they were ship fearing seamen. And they were they were going to be on the uh, on the coasts, and they were they were they were tradesmen on the waters, so they were their territory came out to be on the coast, the port cities. Um, the tribe of Dun were warriors. Their tribe their territory actually was on the frontier of the land of Israel to protect the border because they were the, they were the mighty war, warriors, um, and so on and so forth. We find that every 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 tribe was given a unique area of land that was most conducive for them. Whereas the Kohanim and the Levium, their vocation was meant to be teachers, priests, and, and the teachers of Torah. And so it is for that reason that they weren't given land specifically because land is a distraction. Land is something that needs to be worked on. Uh, occupation would be something that their occupation, as the Torah says, Hashem hu nachalato. These are the words the Torah uses for the tribe of Levi. Hashem hu nachalato. God is their portion in the land. God is their, is their uh, occupation. So when God is your occupation, you have to be free, both physically and conceptually and, um, and emotionally free from being involved in day-to-day -to, -day to be free to be able to focus on what God wants you to do. And so these two, you see uh, these two sections, God wanted that some people should be involved in the material development of the land of Israel, and some people should be involved in the spiritual development of the Jewish people. Once we understand that this idea, we're going to take a step back and go to back to one story. This is a story, and this is a concept that we have discussed a number of times in different classes. Some of you are familiar with it, but the, we know that the portion before the story of Korach is the portion of Shlach, which is the story of the spies. 
And so the, the way the Torah juxtaposes these two stories, at the first comes the story of the spies, then comes the story of Korach, it becomes obvious that these two stories are connected to each other in some way. And according to Kabbalah, this, the connection of the, of the stories is this, that the real reason the spies did not want to go into the land of Israel was not because they were afraid of losing the war. They were not they, because they were afraid of the battle, not because they thought that, God forbid, they, we couldn't conquer the land. They had no illusions about that. The reason the spies we know according to the according to this according to the mystical I, meaning why they did not want to enter the land of Israel was because they did not want to engage have to engage with the material world. They were simply afraid of letting go of the spiritual life, the spiritual oasis that existed in the desert. So if you can imagine that the people at that time were living with Moshe in the desert, they were studying Torah whole day. They didn't have to work. The food fell from heaven. There, there was no jobs. There was no. There was nobody to fight. It was a blissful reality. What did What did you do a whole day? You spent time with your family, and you studied Torah. It was almost like living in the year 2020 in in COVID time, where you 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 you're, you live in a cocoon, not because there's a pandemic raging outside, but there's no office to go to. You work from home. And God is telling you, stop running around, stop, stop, stay at home, get to know your family a little better, you know, do some work from your home and spend more time learning, spend more time studying Torah. I'm going to force you inside your home. And so the Jewish people were forced inside this desert where they had nowhere to go, nowhere to run to, nothing to do. What do you do a whole day? You learn Torah. And now we understand that the story is that the spies came back and said, you're crazy. We're going to leave this life to go into the land of Israel. You know what's going on in the land of Israel? We're going to have to go back to work. After there's a vaccine, we're all going to have to go back to work again. And life is going to resume. And you know what? One day, we're going to wake up and say, what? Was it really worth it to go back to working 16 hours a day and to be breathing in front of everybody's face and to be running around and being stressed out? Do you remember those days when we, when we sat at home? And we can study Torah three times a week on Zoom and we can get up late and we're not rushing to the office and we don't have to uh, put on a, sit in uncomfortable clothes and a tie and a suit all the time. Why? Because we can relax and study Torah as long as we want. I don't know if people are ever going to say that, but certainly the spies were anticipating that they were giving up a life that they were familiar with that was somewhat easy for a life of the unknown. And they said, why are we doing it? But ultimately, they said that, to, that if we don't have to engage with the material world and we can work from home, so to speak, we can serve Hashem where we are right now and not have to go into Israel, let's stay where we are. But why was God so angry, even though they had a good point? The, the, the spies had a good point. The Jewish people had a good point. That if, if God created the world for the Jewish people to study Torah, when are we going to have a better time to study Torah than in the desert? With no distraction, no worry, no having to earn a living. If the, if the purpose is spirituality, then why was the demand of the Jewish people to Moshe wrong? The answer is, is that we don't get to decide the purpose of creation. If I had to ask you in one sentence, what is the mission statement of creation? And why did God create the world? It says because Hashem desired to make a dwelling place for himself in the low worlds. In, this, in the language, it says, this, are, this is how the mystics, the Kabbalists, in one sentence describe the most complicated question to ever, be, to ever been asked. Why did God create the world? Why did God create? What is God needed for? What is the purpose of life? What is it for? What is the purpose of this universe? And the answer is that God des desired that he wanted to create a spiritual dwelling, a spiritual oasis, in the lowest possible physical of worlds, and that's this, our world. We spend a lifetime trying to escape this world. Some, some people are building rockets 
because they want to colonize Mars. They want to figure out life on other planets. With global warming, they're afraid that we're not going to have a planet to live in very soon, and we better have a backup plan. The fact of the matter is, is that it's this planet that God wanted to create a, a place for God, which is why he put us here. And so for us to say that we do not want to interact with this world, we want to escape this world, we want to isolate rather than interact, is to deny the very purpose of why God created us and the world in the first place. And, then, and so while the intention is noble, that we want to, to, we want to disconnect and lead a spiritual life, Ultimately, that's not why God put us here. God could have put, created angels to study Torah a whole day in the Garden of Eden. The fact that God created us with evil inclinations in a physical, challenging world means that there's some kind of divine purpose in that interaction that we have to figure out. The role of spirituality that God created, and it does have a role, was that it should be progressive. Progressive, not in a liberal sense, but in a linear sense. What does that mean? That our first should be, we should go through the Sinai Desert. We should live a isolated life, but then we should march into the land of Israel. Once we came to the land of Israel, there were some Jews, the tribe of Levi, who had no, no territory in the land. And so they had a combination where they took an element of the desert where they had, where we had no permanence and they came into the land of Israel and they were travelers who lived, so to speak, not so much nomadically, but they did not have permanent land like everybody else. But for the majority of the people, Hashem wanted us to live physical lives infused with spirituality but God gave us oases. He gave us markers that there are times like Shabbat, like a holiday, that we can withdraw and become spiritual beings, that every single Jew can have that full aspect as well. So even though like, God wants some Jews to be merchants and God wants some Jews to be warriors or tradesmen or craftsmen or tailors or farmers, whatever they may be, every person has the ability to tap into their soul and the special unique times. But certainly once a week on Shabbat, where everybody feels has the same spirituality. Maimonides famously said that every single person of, of the world, not even, he says, not even Jewish, any person, any human being, whose generosity of spirit motivates them and who understands with their wisdom to set themselves aside, to stand before God and to serve Hashem and to minister to Him and to know Hashem, to want to understand Hashem, to proceed justly as God made them. And that person is sanctified as the Holy of Holies. Hashem will be their portion and heritage forever and God will provide their needs for them in this world just as he provided for the Kohanim and the, and the Levian, which means Maimonides says that every person today can accept that yoke upon them. If you want to, and you want to say that you're going to be connected and serve Hashem with your heart and soul 100%, then Hashem will have to treat you like a Kohen or a Levi who has no territory, and he relies on Hashem for sustenance, physically, literally, not just through in, uh, on, a, on a spiritual level. But once we understand the story that Hashem, after the story of the spies, Hashem told the spies, I understand what you want, but it's not why I put you here. I want you to go into the land of Israel. I want you to develop the land that transformed the land. And I want you to connect and bring spirituality into this physical world. Then we can understand now why Korach comes right afterwards. So Korach said, oh, if that's the case, that Hashem wants material life and working and having a vocation, having a job and doing mitzvot is just as equally important as studying Torah and living a spiritual life, then he says, I want that too. Korach says, I want to have that too. And really, all Jews should have the opportunity to ask for that. All Jews should be equal that way because if we're going to stay in the desert and study Torah, then no nobody 
no two people understand Torah the same, right? When you when you study, if, if Torah is the most important thing in a Jew's life, you have to have teachers, you have to have rabbis, you have to have people who study and know the subject. But if the main purpose is to go into the land of Israel and do mitzvot and to bring the spiritual into the physical, then everybody can do that equally. You don't have to be a great genius to figure out how to do a mitzvah. A mitzvah, everybody does the same. You, as the as the uh, as the Rebbe very eloquently said, that when Moshe shakes a lulav of an etrog, and a regular guy shakes a lulav of an etrog, it's exactly the same thing. When Moshe puts on tefillin and another person puts on tefillin, it's exactly the same thing. The intention is different, the spirituality is different, but the act is the same. If the act is the most important thing, then why do we have to have such division amongst and hierarchy amongst the Jewish people? So which actually makes Korach's question stronger? Why was he wrong? The story that happened before him with the spies actually supports his claim that we do not need leaders if everybody, if God wants everybody to do mitzvot in the same way. Why is he, why is he called the essence of divisiveness when he's just fighting for equality for everybody else? His parallel tracks seem ideal. Korach is, Korach is demanding that if all Jews are the same, equally but different, not no one path is more important or better than the other. A Kohen is not better than a Levi. A Levi is not better than an Israelite. An Israelite is not better than an, any, any other socioeconomic person of, of any area of life. Everybody should be treated the same. So the question is, why was he wrong? So ultimately the answer as, as, is, is really the answer of every single class until now. So for those who have been paying close attention to the nuance of the, of the idea of the answer of every class, understand that the tension and the complication and why, why the, the journey is so difficult to master in life is because God gave us a paradoxical job in this world. On the one hand, God wants to a top-down model, and he also wants an up, a down-up model. God wants us to recognize that there is, there is energy and spirituality coming from above, but he also wants us to create within ourselves the, the inspiration and the drive and the motivation to reach higher on our own. Not that we should sit here and wait for God to give us everything, because as we were studying in last week and the week before and the week before, miracles don't change people. Great events in history really don't change people. People can be inspired, but inspiration, as we learned in every class until now, disappears very quickly. If you don't do something on your own to motivate yourself to continue it. And so this tells us that there's something in that this story is similar to every other story of the Torah, where on the one hand, God says, listen, I want to bring the, the heavens down to earth. On the other hand, I need you. I need you people to bring the earth up to heaven. So God comes and give us, God came down on Mount Sinai and he gives us the Torah and he connects the heavens to the earth. But what is the essence of Torah? The essence of Torah by doing mitzvot, God wants us to elevate the earth to the heaven. He wants us to elevate the material to the spiritual. That's a much harder job. It's a much harder job for us because you know gravity, <laughs> just like physical gravity, the spiritual gravity. Gravity, it's a lot easier to drop things down from high and they fall to the ground. It's a lot harder to push things up a hill than to roll something down, down a mountain. We're trying to roll back thousands of years of history. What are we doing? We're trying to push back by, by doing good, by, doing, by living morally and ethically and doing mitzvot. We're trying to roll back the gravity of materialism, of, of selfishness, of aggression, of divisiveness through doing mitzvot. That's a much harder task than for God to come down the mountain and just give us the Torah in one moment. God gave us, how long did the giving of the Torah last? It lasted several moments, the Ten Commandments. And you know, 
we've been spending the last several thousand years trying to figure out how to do it properly because lightning takes a second, but learning how to cultivate it and how to use it properly takes a lifetime. And so this is the tension, this is the difficulty with trying to figure out why Korach was really wrong because Korach essentially on the externally, on the surface, he, he sounds right, he sounds noble, he sounds inspirational. But as I mentioned before, when we look at history, we realize that the you know, slogans and slang words and powerful catchphrases are simply just that. They are not game changers. They are, they are ideas, but ideas that tell you that we are inspired to do something, but we don't understand how to do it is why humanity is where it is. So for example, we always assume that certain things like, like a, a, a word like pluralism or a word like equality or parallel separate but equal are always noble ideas. But what we're gonna find out now is it doesn't always turn out that way. In the beginning, it sounds great and it looks great on paper, but that actually creates more divisiveness, more aggression and more fighting internally than the other way. Like I said before, the very movements, the very revolutions of history that sought to overthrow one type of model for a more equal and egalitarian model actually caused much more damage and much more heartache than the movements that they were coming to overthrow. And the, que the question is why? Why does it work out that way? Why are movements that start off with so much promise and that the ideas behind them are so pure, why are they so corrupted when they actually happen? Why does the idea of, in other words, in our case, why is the idea of Korach so powerfully intoxicating, but in actuality and practice, it is actually devastating? Korach's argument is we can take a rainbow. Everybody is a different shade, a different rainbow, but everybody is the same. And everybody has their own path. And we don't need a path where everybody is intertwined and everyone is dependent upon the other. Okay, so let us unpack this idea about the, the Moshe's model versus Korach's model. You see a world where there isn't a system where you have nurturers and people that need to be nurtured, where you have a system where people are dependent upon each other with a covenant of relationship it begins to fall apart ultimately when you get to the end. So if you see on your chart, why is Korach considered the essence of divisiveness? Because let's see how this goes. There are two types of differences. There's a difference, there are differences where everybody is driving their own car and going their own way, so to speak. And as you see, as you can see in this picture, everybody is getting in each other's way because everybody has their own way where they want to go. And then there are differences that can harmonize and each person complements what the other person has. Like in music, you know, they, famously it's been said that 
if I am talking and somebody else interrupts and starts talking, it's called an interruption. But if I'm singing and somebody else starts singing, it's called harmonizing. Same thing, right? You're talking and I start talking. What am I doing? I'm being disrespectful. I'm interrupting you. But if you're singing and I start singing too, it can blend together, become, it becomes harmonious. Why is one disruptive and one harmonious? It's because ultimately the, the idea depends not just on the destination, but on the journey itself. How are, we, how are we doing this journey together? When you have a parallel track as Korach advocates, where everybody is equal but different and everybody is the same, in the beginning, it looks very good. On stage number one, everybody is doing their own thing. In stage number two, everybody becomes starts living in their own cocoon. As you start going further and further down, what actually happens is that everybody's existence becomes a threat to the other person's existence. And when I don't need you and you don't, don't need me, when there are no interpersonal relationships where there's something that I need from you and that you need from me, or what we would call reciprocal relationship, then you have a breakdown in society. You have a breakdown in, you have a breakdown in humanity. When you have a breakdown in humanity, you have a breakdown in the whole idea of creation. Remember, the whole essence of creation is a reciprocal relationship. God creates, God gives us, but God also demands something back from us. Any relationship where one is only giving and one is only taking or vice versa, eventually you have a breakdown. There is no relationship there. So the relationship of creation, that's why the Talmud tells us that when a Jew keeps Shabbat, they become a partner in creation. The idea behind being a partner in creation means that it's reciprocal. God says, I'm creating something unfinished and I need you to finish it. And when you do it, when you, when you say the Kiddush on Friday night, you become a full partner in creation. And so when we, when we broaden out the lens, so to speak, we take a step back, we understand that the creation is, is, has these two facets to it. On one hand, God created a, a, a material world that is constantly striving to escape its own lowliness and go higher and higher. But he also created a spiritual element to go and become enmeshed in it and to become engrossed in it, to help it elevate itself out. And each one needs the other. Just as the body needs the soul and the soul needs the body, the higher worlds need the lower worlds and the lower worlds need the higher worlds. Each one needs to engage with each other. When you have with, when you have a situation where there's no interaction, where spiritual exists on its own and physical exists on its own, you have this barrier. The, the Midrash actually tells us that before the giving of the Torah, that actually existed. Um, there's, you know, there's, a, uh, there's a line that we say in, in Hallel, it's in the Tehillim, that says, Hashemayim Shemayim La Hashem, the heavens belong to God, the Haaretz Natan Livnei Adam, but the earth, the world, he gave to human beings. Which means before the giving of the Torah, the Medrash says there were two worlds. There was a spiritual world, a physical world, they had nothing to do with each other. When God gave the Torah, what did God do? God made a point of coming down onto Mount Sinai, elevating the physical to the spiritual and drawing down the spiritual to the physical that they should have a relationship with each other. There should be, there should, there should be reciprocity that each one has something that the other one needs. In life, God created a world where there are, by definition, people who are givers and people who are receivers. Now, idea, ideally, from a Korach perspective, we can ask, why did God create a world where you have people who, in order to maximize their 
potential in life. They have to learn how to be generous and to share and to give. And then there are people who have to be, be humble and learn how to receive. Because God could have made everybody givers and no, and nobody needs anything. But imagine a world where nobody needs anything from anybody else because everybody's equal, everybody's the same. And so I don't need anything from you and you don't need anything from me. As I showed you before in those bubbles, a world like that means a world without relationship, a world without reciprocity, a world where everybody lives on their own, but no one needs another person. And because no one needs another person, there is no way to create harmony, not just in music, but there's no way to create a society because everybody is in for themselves because they don't believe that they're part of something bigger. When you're part of a, even the, even if you are, you, we, can, like we can use the example of an orchestra or a, or a team or of a, uh, a, a play or a film, any example you want, everybody has a role to play. Not everybody has the same role. As a matter of fact, no two people can have the same role. Imagine coming in and say, I want to have an orchestra where everybody plays the violin, nothing else. Everybody's equal. Or everybody is going to be the lead soloist. Or everybody's going to play first base. Or everybody's the quarterback. Or everybody does everything the same. Obviously, you, you don't have, you, don't, you, you, you have chaos. The idea sounds profound, but true art, true music can only come about when everybody understands that every role enhances the other person. A conductor, a true conductor can hear, even in an orchestra of 250 people, if only one musician who's only supposed to play two notes doesn't play them, maybe someone sitting in the audience doesn't understand the difference. The conductor knows because every person, every member of that orchestra has a key role to play and everyone is dependent. Remember, you've, you've all heard the expression that, a, um, that we're only as strong as the weakest link, right, of a chain. The idea behind, of you, the idea behind humanity and society is that we have a covenantal relationship of, in society, that we are only as strong as the weakest link within us. And God created that system to, 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 to make us understand that the way we advance society forward, the way Judaism brings the ball, so to speak, to the goalpost to a messianic time is when everybody realizes that we all have a role to play not no role is more important than the other for right we may think that there are some roles that are more important but if everybody doesn't play their role then the whole thing collapses the whole pyramid falls apart i want you to know that it's a, it's a very powerful teaching that when after the jewish people worship the golden calf hashem turns to moshe moshe at that time was still in heaven he was on top of he was enveloped by the clouds and Hashem tells Moshe, go down. Your people have desecrated and have defiled what they have been taught. They, they built a golden calf. Rashi quotes the Talmud. He says, Hashem tells Moshe, uses the words, go down. Why does Hashem tell Moshe, go down? The Medrash tells us that Hashem told Moshe, I'm demoting you. Go down from your spiritual level. You are, you are being dragged down with them. You have to go down. You're, you're not just physically to go down to them, but lech reid migdulatcha, take a step down from your great holy status. And the Talmud, I never, all the commentaries ask the obvious question. What did Moshe do wrong? Moshe wasn't even there. He didn't even know about it. He wasn't on planet earth. Why is he held being held responsible for what the Jewish people did? And you know what the answer is? Moshe is only Moshe because of the Jewish people. Moshe is only, Moshe is the leader of the Jewish people. And Moshe's authority and power and his spiritual greatness come because he's Moshe, the leader of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people fall, he falls automatically with them. He's not above them. Moshe is like the conductor when, if the musician makes a mistake, the conductor is embarrassed. 
the conductor fails. Even though the conductor didn't make, didn't sing the wrong note or play the wrong instrument, right? He didn't do it. But because he is the conductor, he's responsible. It affects him. Anything the Jewish people did over all of those years affected Moshe just the same. From here we see that there is no such thing as Korach saying, everybody's the same, everybody's equal, we're all holy, we don't need to be dependent upon each other, we don't need to have leaders, we don't need to have different roles to play, we're all going to play the same role. It's folly, it's stupidity, right? The life, the universe, and society can only be advanced when everybody realizes that when I play my role, I'm not just playing it for myself, I'm playing it, playing it for it on behalf of everybody. So a person may think, you know what? I just have a small role to play. I'm an Israelite. I'm not a Kohen. I'm not a Levi. But it doesn't, that, that, that's, that doesn't work that way. Every person is a actor, so to speak, in this ensemble. And when one person doesn't do, doesn't understand what that their role is indispensable, the whole system collapses. The whole picture collapses. The whole team collapses. Just by one person being out of position, it affects everybody. So when you have the idea of reciprocal relationships mean that sometimes it's moving around and around, some are on top and some are on bottom, but if everyone understands that they're holding hands and that they are involved in each other's lives, then you're all part of one. I'm sure many, many, some of you remember a couple of weeks, it was at, at last Shabbat, I spoke about uh, two Shabbats ago. I spoke about this idea of Vayetze, the famous teaching that when Yaakov puts his head down on a bunch, on a rock and all the rocks started complaining that they wanted Yaakov to lay down on the rock. And the famous story of the Medrash that Hashem made a miracle and he made all the rocks turn into one rock. And the, the question the Rebbe always asked, used to ask is, what do you gain by that? You could take a hundred rocks and make them to one rock, but Yaakov can only lay down on one part of the rock. He's still not laying down on all the, all the rocks. And the answer is, is that if I believe I'm a separate rock, we're all equal and we're all, all the same, then you are you and I am I. And if Yaakov is with you, he's not with me. But if we are one, we become one stone. It makes no difference where... We are all in this together. We are all one. And when someone is one, it makes no difference which part of the one because the essential one, the essence, it permeates throughout all of it. And by being one, everyone felt that they were sharing in this reciprocal process. Less and so... In summation, as we get here to the end, I'm gonna. I'll read to you how, why, why, on the surface, separate but equal tracks seems like a better plan, but it doesn't always work out, and why the re the reciprocal relationship of Moshe's model ultimately creates unity while the other one creates conflict. And that's why Korach is seen as a paradigm for conflict, even though at, at the outset, he, he is clamoring for equality and unity. Because we have, you have to look through the, how the stages develop one from the other. In stage one, everything looks beautiful. Every, everything is in a straight line. But in stage two, I'm going to go back to it. Let's go here. See, back to when you, when you get to stage two, each track is completely independent of the other. I don't need you for anything, and you don't need me for anything. It still might be an okay situation. Some might even say it's a positive thing. But then you move to stage three. Inter, inter, inter independence from each other creates a state of alienation. Everyone lives in a bubble. Everybody's disconnected. We're very different and we don't understand each other's world. We tolerate each other because we value tolerance, but we're still living in, each, in our own world and then we don't understand each other. Finally, in stage four, what happens? It begins to fall apart and the and conflict begin. Why? Because 
look at the world we live in. When people live in their own bubbles, as we as many people do today, we look at each other as the enemy because I live totally in my bubble. I don't need you for anything. You don't need me for anything. We live in different worlds. In Moshe's model, the spiritual may se can seem higher than the material. A materially engaged person makes no difference whether they're a farmer or a business person. They look up to spiritually engaged people for guidance and inspiration and trying to raise themselves to a more spiritual level. But there's also the reverse. The Kohen, how do you think the Kohanim survived? How, how did a Levite survive? Remember I told you they didn't have any land. How did they survive? They had, to, they had to humble themselves and they had to go to the Israelites and they had to get, they survived on the fact that the farmers would support them. So the Kohanim would teach the Jewish people and the Jewish people would support the Kohanim and the Levites for that privilege. And that's why Hashem created the system that the Kohanim and the Levim would be dependent on the materialism of the farmers and the, and, the, and the business people who would support them. Think about how this model works today. It's called Yisachar, it's called the Yisachar Zavulan Partnership. It happens all over the Jewish world today. You have people who study in yeshiva. You have people studying in kolo. And there are people in business that look at, that for them it's the greatest honor and privilege to support and give financial assistance to someone to study in yeshiva. Why? Because not everybody can be a rabbi and not everybody can study in a yeshiva, not everybody can study in a kolo. Not everybody has a head for business. Not everybody can be successful in business. But God created Yisachars of the world, who their goal is to be the Kohanim and the Levim, to be the spiritual guides. God created the Zevulans of the world, who they like to be on the ships and doing business. But it, you know what? When it works together, those who study Torah don't study just for themselves. They're studying to share and to teach. Those who go to business and go to the office every morning are not going just to make money for themselves and their family. They understand that they have an obligation to support synagogues, to support Torah, to support ed Jewish education. This reciprocal, imagine in Korach's model, Korach's model is everybody's the same. Everybody does for themselves. Everybody lives in their own bubble. Everybody lives in their own world. I don't need you. You don't need me. Imagine a world where a rabbi does not need a congregation and the congregation does not need a rabbi. A yeshiva, does not need financial supporters, and financial supporters don't care whether or not there are children studying Torah or not. Think about that. There, there is no Jewish people anymore. There is no, there is no Jewish nation. There is no world. The greatest gift. That's what Moshe was trying to explain to Korach. I didn't set it up. God set it up. God set it up that you know what? Not everybody can be a coin. Not everybody can be a levy, and not everybody can be an Israelite. God gave you your gift in life. God, not, every, not everybody can be a quarterback, not everybody is the lead actor, and not everybody is the conductor of the orchestra, but everybody has a role to play that's indispensable. And when a Kohen or, so, or a rabbi does their job, they are elevating those and inspiring those who spend their day at work. But at the same time, those who spend the day at work right, have also have, what's their role? Their role is not just to take. Their role is not, they're not just in the bottom. That eventually flips. They have the gift that the Kohen needs to come to them for their support. And so this, this mutual reciprocal relationship goes round and round where the spiritual needs the physical, the physical needs the spiritual, but it creates a powerful circle. Lesson and six. Korach's allows everyone rebellion. to recognize that we are part of one, one greater whole. Korach and challenged the leadership of Moses and Aaron. He objected to the hierarchy that Moses had instituted, other. which implied that those who dedicate so their lives exclusively to serving God were holier than those who occupied themselves with the material world. In Korach's view, spiritual and material. Uh, and, and in Moshe's response, we see how Moshe is challenging Korach back that those who do that are generally the ones who want power for themselves. And only by following the structure that God set up in this world can we have a harmonious people where everybody recognizes whether it's man or woman.
Cohen, Levi, Israelite, no matter what your vocation in life, no matter what your role in life, if you recognize that your what your gift and your role to play is indispensable to the whole circle of history, then you realize that there's no such thing as somebody or anybody that's different, that's less. There is no such thing that's less. The, 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 the greatest coin in the world, the high priest, the coin Gadol, only survived because there were Jews who would come and support him. He had, he had to make himself humble enough to accept gifts, literally, from the people, 24 types of gifts, whether it was Teruma or whether it was um, the, the, uh, the, the, the cities that were spread out amongst the territories of the Jewish people, or all the other gifts that the Jewish people brought to the temple, like Bikurim, this is that, that the Kohanim and the Levites showed that, that the interdependence is, does not work one way. We don't just teach you, we don't just inspire you, we don't just pray for you, but we are part of you, a part of your life, and that we live because of you, and that you live because of us, that creates the most powerful connection. And that's why till today, the Jewish people are not just a family, we are like a single organism because we are so embedded with, e with e in each other that, that Moshe explained to Korach, we cannot separate. Once we separate, we are doomed. And this is the ultimate lesson that from all the lessons really of all these classes, and, and that is that there cannot just be a one-way street. It's a two-way street. It's up the, it's spiritual to the physical, physical to the spiritual. God gives us and, and inspires us but no, no matter how much he inspires us, God needs us to challenge ourselves to take that inspiration and to transform ourselves because lasting change and permanent change only comes about when we are willing to put the hard work in, in ourselves. And so um, this, is, this, this, is the, um, this, this is the gift. You know, we, we, I can explain to you this in a million different ways and metaphors, but that, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's like you, can go, you can go to a quick fix and have a surgery to uh, eliminate a few pounds, but it's not going to last unless you're gonna be willing to exercise on a day-to-day -day basis. You can, there are, there's a quick fix. There are, there are always quick fixes in life, but those are always temporary. The only things that have lasting value and lasting change are the ones that we tackle and embrace on our own, no matter how difficult, when we achieve it, it lasts. The ones that happen from, that, that, that are given to us like a gift without a lot of hard work, have a lot of value in the beginning, but all, all, always, 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 the merits and the value of it wears off when we are not willing to lift it up on our own and work on it ourselves. Thank you very much, and um, wish all of you to have a happy Hanukkah starting tomorrow Thank night. Thank you. A Hanukkah like no, like a, a unique Hanukkah like we haven't had before. We will be sending out information. We will be doing a, a, some some uh, some Zoom and some other things online that we can share and and do a Hanukkah celebration together um, with some learning and some singing and some inspiration. So no matter even though we're doing everybody's doing Hanukkah their own way at home. We will still do it together as a community as best as we can. So may God bring the light into your lives. And may we celebrate as we see at the, at the end of the prayer on Hanukkah that God should show us the light to get brighter and brighter. And may we live to see very soon the big, 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 big menorah. You know, in the, in the old city of Jerusalem, there's a huge menorah. Um, when you come down, before you get down to the Western Wall, and the, there's a plaza where they built a replica of the menorah that's ready to be used. As soon as it's, it's, it, the reason why they built it was that as soon as the Messiah comes, we already have a menorah ready to go. There's, there was a, there's an institute in Israel that has been building and creating many of the artifacts for the temple. So we shouldn't have to wait around and figure out, oh no, how are we going to get it all together so fast? So there's a, there is a menorah waiting. In, in the city, it's, it's, it's encased in a big, thick glass. You can see it. It's an it's amazing gold menorah that's sitting in, in the middle of the old city in a piece of glass. That's that's a life-size replica that will be kosher to be used in the temple soon right away. So may we all merit that to uh, to be able to st stand very soon in the courtyards of Jerusalem to see it ourselves.
being lit again. Have a Baruch wonderful Hashem. night. Yes. And, and a happy Hanukkah. Thank you 